teaching skills, teaching speaking, thinking about speaking. The goal of most learners and their parents is to become a good speaker of English and to be able to communicate well with native and non-native speakers. Because spoken communication usually takes place spontaneously and in real time, it's necessary for learners to have a lot of practice in the classroom. You learn to speak by speaking, and learners need to gain confidence and improve their oral fluency, accuracy and automaticity. Let's start with a discussion activity that you will discuss further in the group discussion and online tutorial. Pause the video and work with your partner. Read and rank the following statements from 1 to 7. You can also find them in your task sheet. Put the one you most agree with first and the one you least agree with last. Be prepared to share and compare your ideas later and when you're ready click to continue this input. What is speaking? The previous activity raised a lot of issues about what speaking really is and in this first section we're going to think more about that. Speaking is not a single thing. It's a complex skill and involves many sub-skills, strategies and the ability to deal with interaction in real time. So pause for a moment and think deeply about this. What skills and strategies do learners need in order to be effective speakers of English? Make some notes on your task sheet and when you're ready Click to continue. Being able to speak and communicate well in a language involves many different skills. As we said before, those skills need to be automatic in order to deal with real-time interaction. To communicate successfully in speaking, our learners need to be able to use grammar and vocabulary and expressions accurately and appropriately. They need to pronounce sounds and use appropriate stress and intonation well. And they need to speak with some fluency, without too many hesitations, and making their meaning clear. Not only do learners need the mechanical and linguistic skills to speak in English, they need to master interactive communication skills as well. And these include the following showing interest during a conversation, using small phrases, words and sounds or gestures such as uh-huh, yeah, wow, really? to show the speaker that they're listening, interested in what they're saying. They also need awareness of how conversations work and the language people typically use for those purposes. For example, ways of starting and finishing a conversation. Hi, how are you? or Anyway, I have to go now. Turn-taking is another convention they need. It differs according to cultural and social norms. Learners need to indicate that they finish saying what they want to say or that they'd like to speak next. Conversations are co-constructed. There is a negotiation of meaning between the speakers and learners need to be able to check understanding, verify understanding and ask for clarification when necessary. And this means checking that you understand what the other person is saying by using small phrases and expressions. And when misunderstanding happens, as it frequently does, learners need to repair their speech and be more precise, or say things in another way. We call these repair strategies, and they're a significant part of being a fluent speaker. So how can we create a classroom that fosters speaking skills? A good way to begin is by teaching language which learners can use in day-to-day -day interaction during class. For example, language for classroom routines and activities. In the classroom, you could introduce expressions such as It's my turn or What does that mean? or Can I go to the toilet please? Over time, these become automatic. You can focus more on sound, word stress, intonation and other phonological features to improve their accuracy. Regular and repetitive use of spoken English 
helps learners gain confidence by showing them the result of effective communication and the value of speaking in English. Here's another little task for you to try. Look at the picture, it's on your worksheet. The children are using English in different classroom interactions. So pause the video and imagine what the children in 1, 2 and 3 are saying. Make a note of your ideas and the kind of language you could expect a child to use in a class that you teach or you've observed. You can discuss your ideas with your group or your tutor later. And when you're ready, click to continue. Creating an environment that fosters spoken communication is more than introducing lists of words or decontextualized sentences. Think back to the input on first and second language acquisition and the conditions that children need to develop their first language. Children need to have a set of high frequency chunks, phrases and expressions which they can use in learning tasks and activities. And we call this task language or process language. It's the language that students need to interact together when they're completing common activities. When you're planning your lessons, analyse the tasks and predict what language the learners will need that's critical for task achievement in English. For example, if it's an arts and craft activity, you could introduce simple phrases such as Can I have some glue please? or Pass me the crayons please? or Could you help me cut this out? You could pre-teach unfamiliar language and encourage your learners to use it in the task. You may need to prompt them at first, but they'll rapidly get the idea if the language is useful to them. And what's more, they'll get a great deal of repetition, which is great for memorization. For some types of activity, you could pre-teach functional language for a particular speaking skill that you want to practice. Functions could include how to agree or disagree, interrupting or suggesting, and if there's too much language to pre-teach, then you could find a more suitable task, or reduce the task, or you could introduce the phrases gradually over time as you build up the learner's repertoire. Many teachers use language posters, large written signs or speech bubbles as reference material, and you can display these on the wall or the board so that children can more easily find the phrases and expressions they need when they need them. Textbook English is unlikely to prepare children for real-life communication and we should make sure we focus equally on real-life speaking. While this may demand more in terms of comprehension, language knowledge and the skills that they need, it offers our learners a model which they can copy and develop over time. Young learners will copy your pronunciation and intonation, so you need to provide them with good models which they can follow and make sure that you, the way you speak to children in your classroom is authentic, even if it's graded to their level. An activity will be more effective when there is a realistic need for communication, a genuine purpose. No one is motivated by speaking, or writing for that matter, with no purpose or audience. You should avoid display questions, such as, what is my name, or is this a book, or is it Wednesday today? Where it's very obvious that the person already knows the answer. Display questions are a product of teaching practice, but they're not common at all in real life. So try to use real questions instead. Think about how your learners might use spoken language each day in their normal lives and transfer this to the classroom. For example, making small talk with family and friends, or making a phone call to mum and dad, or talking about an event or a piece of news. People everywhere will often tell little anecdotes or comment on a recent experience. We use language to look for and find things, talk about what we're eating and so on. All of these are great topics and provide a rich source of language. Some things may stop our learners from sounding natural. In the early stages of language learning, 
it's common for learners to use direct translation. It's a type of communication strategy just to get by. But it means our learners will be difficult to understand and they'll sound unnatural. You can help by reformulating what they say and introducing a more natural or native-like way of saying the same thing. Formality is another area that affects how natural learners sound. They need awareness of language that is too formal or informal for a given context. One reason this happens is that learners will typically learn a written form of English in their general schooling. And written English, with its neat sentences and range of language, is very different from spoken forms. You wouldn't finish a conversation with a friend by saying, you're sincerely, would you? So this is an important area and something to consider when you're planning your lessons and deciding what language to introduce to help them do that. What can we say about oral interaction in the classroom? What makes a good speaking task? And how can we organise the classroom and our learners to maximise interaction? In a speaking lesson, learners should spend more time talking with each other and less time listening to the teacher talking. Maximising learner talking time is the goal and you can set up plenty of pair work or have learners work in small groups. Other interaction patterns you learned about are the conveyor belt format, onion rings and mingling as a whole class. As always, variety is the spice of life and in this way learners have greater opportunities to learn from each other and gain confidence. Some teachers think that practicing in pairs is best for production. However, it's very possible that this alone won't push them to say as much as possible. There's too much temptation to talk in their first language. So pair work can be a useful private practice stage, which you can follow with more open speaking, a kind of performance stage after, when they speak more publicly. When learners speak together, They'll want to cooperate more and adjust their language to make sure meaning is clear. Classes contain learners of varying abilities, and there are different ways that you can organise that. You could, for example, pair weaker learners together and stronger learners together, or you could pair weaker learners with stronger ones. Mixing it up is the best strategy, I think. Use a variety of interaction patterns to help motivate your learners and to give them as much speaking time as possible. So, just to summarise, practice in pairs, it's great for general communication and production, and it encourages a negotiation of meaning and modified output. Pair weak or weak with strong, strong or weak, strong, and mix it around. Encourage your quieter students by calling on them or by asking them specific questions. And some learners, as you know, like to hold the floor, and that can take time away from others. You'll want to be sensitive, but ultimately your focus must remain on the whole group. So think about how you can rein in those verbose students in your classes in a positive way. Often, teachers are clear on what the learners will be doing during a speaking task, but find it difficult to define their own role. We need to plan our interventions and support in advance so that we're aware of how we can best help our students and focus our work towards improving their output. Pause the video and consider the roles a teacher can adopt during speaking tasks. You might want to refer back to your notes from previous input for this. What do you think is important in order to create optimal conditions for speaking practice? And how can you help improve learners' performance during a task? And how would you follow up and deal with errors after? Make notes, and when you're ready, click to continue. An important role for the teacher during speaking practice is simply to provide a fun, safe and comfortable environment. Try to raise confidence by showing interest, giving lots of praise and commenting what the learners are saying as well as the language they use to say it. The practice activity must be set up well and this means giving clear instructions 
and demonstrating what the learners have to do. The teacher can provide a good model by rephrasing and extending what the students say. For example, if your student says, I very like chocolate, you can say, oh, you really like chocolate because it's sweet and yummy. While the students are doing the practice task, the teacher monitors. And this means walking around the classroom, listening and helping. Sometimes things become confused and students need help saying what they need to say. You may need to encourage quieter students as well and hold back the louder ones. But don't interrupt the speaking task or correct small errors. Save them for later. This helps develop fluency first, accuracy later, which is the natural way that people learn. It's helpful to note down errors and then you can deal with these in a group stage at the end. After the practice, you should provide feedback and conclusion to the task. This stage might include correcting common errors you've heard, highlighting good use of language, providing the students with new expressions that they were struggling for. Also, you could tell the students how successful they were and make some comments about what they've heard. You could comment, for example, on things that you found interesting, surprising or funny. It's not only about the language, it's also about the content. In previous input sessions, you looked into the staging of receptive skills tasks and lessons, reading and listening. So how do we stage a productive skills task or activity? And what are the main stages? What is important to include and in what order? So here's another task for you to complete. Pause the video and make some notes with your first thoughts about staging. Think back to the lesson staging for reading and listening. What stages might apply to speaking as well? And what other stages do you think it's necessary to include? Make some notes on your task sheet and when you're ready, click to continue. Let's look at the stages of a speaking lesson. The staging here is aimed at teenagers and older learners and it's intended to take them through the entire process from generating their ideas to interacting together. In your classroom practice, you could adapt this model and we'll look at a simplified version next. As in any lesson, you need first to engage your students and set the context. This could be done through pictures, a game or a song or by listening to a group of learners actually doing the same task. The next stage is pre-teaching language. As always, this is not the main aim, so you need to keep it short. You could make a glossary of useful language items on the board, introduce or review any expressions, phrases or chunks that they might need. If it's absolutely necessary, you could do some quick revision of grammar and vocabulary. And of course, you'll want to drill pronunciation of any key language. You can do that chorally and individually. Provide controlled practice and then monitor and error correct as necessary and then give some brief feedback. And then move to a freer practice stage and again monitor and note common errors. You should give some brief feedback here but focus more on meaning. Finally, you'll want to list common errors as well as good language examples on the board and highlight some typical things that learners could have said or things that you found interesting or motivating. Adapting it for younger learners is quite simple. We simply move more quickly through the stages and our expectation will be different. We imagine that they will have less to say and that during the speaking task we will need to be more participatory. As usual, we would engage and set the context for the learners, review or pre-teach the language, move into speaking tasks, again, from controlled to freer, and you might want to include task repetition. We'll look at that later. Lastly, provide some feedback on performance and possibly compare it with a model In this section, let's look into some of the fine details related to staging and running those speaking tasks. The first is about providing content. 
Where appropriate, you should try to elicit ideas rather than just give it. And this can be done through brainstorming or displaying so that the learners have plenty of things to talk about. Make notes, show pictures, and build up an interesting web of content that the learners can refer to. Very often, speaking tasks fail, not because the learners don't have the language, but they don't know what to say. So this stage is very important. Helping learners with content is a good way to increase motivation. And another important aspect is to provide thinking and planning time on what they will say and how they'll say it. In spontaneous communication activities, learners have little time to reflect on the language and what they produce may be marked by low levels of linguistic accuracy. So pre-planning helps to reconcile fluency work with the concern for an acceptable level of grammatical accuracy and range. Planning of both language and content will often lead to an improvement in both accuracy and fluency and can also lower the potential anxiety that learners have about speaking. During this stage, the learners can ask you, the teacher, or other students to support them. What's the effect of thinking and planning? Well, this is from research from Pauline Foster, an ELT consultant. She studied how learners responded during five-minute spoken narratives. The table here shows planners and non-planners. So pause for a moment and look at the question marks. What do you think were the differences in the number of pauses or the length of silence between the non-planners and the planners? When you're ready, click to continue. You can see instantly that the results are significantly different. Non-planners on average had 30 pauses during a five minute spoken narrative, while as those that planned paused 12 times. Silence is even more startling. Non-planners were silent for about 120 seconds out of that five minutes, whereas those that planned were silent for only 24. The evidence is very clear that thinking and planning time has a significant effect on the range, accuracy, and the length that learners are prepared to speak. And task repetition also has a significant impact. Repeating a speaking activity has been proved to increase not only the amount that learners say, but also the accuracy and complexity of what they say. But would it be boring for learners to simply do the same things again? Well, probably, but there are ways to mitigate this. You could, for example, use the same task with a different partner or have a different outcome in purpose. Leading ELT researcher Scott Thornbury wrote, simply getting the learners to repeat the task with different partners is a way of producing more grammatically complex language. Having done the activity once as a kind of rehearsal, learners now have more spare attention to devote to the form of their output. There are many benefits to task repetition, and you should consider this when you're planning your own lessons. Task repetition can build fluency. It can improve accuracy. It boosts confidence in motivation. It maximizes the time on task and it provides a variety of interaction. Think about the different contexts and purposes that include speaking in the real world. And think too about the situation for younger children. They're still learning the basic conventions of conversations in their own language culture and interactions in their first language. They're not usually equal partners in a conversation with adults. Adults will frequently be the ones to initiate topics and interactions at home, in school, or other everyday contexts. Think for a moment. What speaking tasks can you think of to use in your classes? If possible, discuss this with a partner and make some notes on your task sheet with your initial ideas. So when you're ready, click to continue. So before we look at specific types of speaking tasks, 
Let's think about what they actually are. In each pair of sentences, work with a partner to decide which of them are speaking activities. And what might the lesser names be, or the task names be, for each of the activities? Spend the time to read through, decide which one is which, and when you're ready, click to continue. OK, let's quickly review. So in the first pair of sentences, pronunciation practice and drilling are not speaking activities. They are controlled practice focused on accuracy and awareness raising. Talking about what you did last weekend is a speaking task. The second pair of sentences, reading aloud is not an authentic speaking activity. It's useful, but we can't call it authentic speaking. And it may involve very different skills from free speaking, such as conversations and chats between friends. And the last pair, well, although your aim in the library roleplay may be for young learners to practice forming questions, the speaking activity shouldn't be impeded by the teacher. So, how many stroke brothers and sisters stroke have is more of a grammar practice activity than speaking. So now let's look at some of the types of activities that you can use. And the first one is dialogues. And these are one of the most common forms of spoken practice in classroom. Done well, they can mimic real-life conversations. However, ELT course materials will frequently tidy up many of the features of genuine speech and reduce them to nothing more than repetitive grammar practice. Listening for meaning. First, have your students listen to the dialogue and answer gist and detail questions. This is similar to a listening lesson. Then, model and drill any phonological patterns. You can use the dialogue to analyse pausing and intonation patterns, and you could drill the key phrases using the recording dialogue, the transcript, as a model. Next, present and recycle grammar and vocabulary in context if necessary, and draw the student's attention to the key items within the text. Here, you could use a discovery approach. For example, ask students to circle words related to free time activities, or phrases used to make suggestions. And after all of this language work, you need to get to the main point. And you can use the dialogue for both controlled and freer practice activities. First, the students can practice the dialogue simply by reading it out, but with some prosody, so adding facial expressions, gestures, etc. Then, they can adapt it and move to a more free form of speaking, where they can substitute the key information with their own ideas and add anything extra that they want. This enables them to personalise the dialogue, but, particularly for lower level learners and for children, it gives them the structure that they need in order to work on extended speaking. It shows that the learners have learned the key phrases and structures, but that they're able to use them flexibly and effectively. Let's not pretend that the approaches I've mentioned here are like real speaking. We can move steadily towards that, but in the early stages, there's certainly a step in the right direction. A game is an activity that takes the mind of the learners away from language as a focus and generates laughter, enjoyment and fun. At least, that's the aim. But like all activities that we introduce in our classrooms, it must have clear language objectives. We use games in the classroom because they provide motivation, Games add variety and fun to learning, and they can energise a class. They often bring high levels of interaction and participation. Games provide language practice, and they help reinforce new sounds, words and structures in a very enjoyable way. They help with communication skills. There is an active use of target language and lots of meaningful repetition. The language practice is hidden since the focus is on the task and not the language. There are many forms of games that you could use in the classroom. Drama and dramatisation. Drama is not theatre, so we're not talking about putting on a show. Better is to refer to it as dramatisation, and that's the process of bringing language alive through the use of role play and it's characterised by the use of gesture, expression and movement. 
This is important for younger children and lower level learners because they might not have the language resources to deal with longer or more demanding speaking tasks. Drama is motivating, the children enjoy acting out stories with words and actions, and it helps both listening and speaking skills. The story provides a memorable context so children remember the language better, and they have to interact with each other and use their language and communication skills in tandem. It combines actions, gestures and facial expressions with oral language, which makes it even more memorable, and it's great for mixed ability groups. Once the children have learned the story, vocabulary and structures are pre-taught, and language is then put together with feeling and movement, the lines can be practiced for the performance if necessary. Drama activities include games, action songs and chants, storytelling or acting out scenes, miming, including group mimes, creative play, role play, and even performing short sketches or longer stretches of text. All of them are great for kids and they'll sure to get behind you. Interviews can be real or in the form of a role play and they offer children the chance to step outside themselves and pretend to be someone they've invented or a famous person they like, such as a sports or pop star. Or they can interview each other for real and give more personal answers and responses. Either way, interviews can lead to a lot of fun and a great deal of speaking. Interviewing each other. This could be about names, hobbies, three things I like, three things I don't like. They could introduce themselves to the class or they could role play. One person could be interviewed by the whole group or they could work in pairs and interview each other then move on to the next. There could be an element of lie detection. For example, when they give their answers, they don't give true answers, and the group has to guess which are the true ones. We've looked at only a few of the many possible speaking tasks that you could include in your lessons, and to conclude this brief section, let's take a look at some other options you can try. Information gaps and experience gaps are some of the most effective activities. The reason is that they provide a real purpose to communicate. One learner has some information and their partner has different or other information. Through talking together, they work to solve a problem, such as making up a story, finding places in a map, or identifying differences between two pictures. And ranking is another thing that's useful. So with ranking activities, learners work together to put things in order of importance. So they can, for example, rank the qualities of a good game or a good teacher from a list of 10. Or if they have $100, they could discuss and prioritize ways to spend it and give reasons. So ranking tasks could include better food or you have free time, better things to do and give reasons. There are many possibilities to ranking and in open class after they can justify their opinions and compare with others. Older and more advanced learners can talk about issues such as public transport or computer games. They can agree and disagree on advantages and disadvantages and come up with different solutions to problems. A planning activity can also be useful. In planning activities, learners work together to organize and agree on a particular course of action in order to achieve, for example, a group holiday or a class event. They then describe it to another group in a form of presentation and then ask and answer any questions. Lastly, circle storytelling and dialogue building. These are really effective and they draw on the student's imagination and all of their linguistic resources, although you can engineer it by using objects and pictures which you know the learners can already talk about. Storytelling is a good idea because it forces students to consider a longer stretch of text. It's more than just a sentence. In some classrooms, particularly with older and more advanced students, one student can start the story and then the next student gives the next sentence. They have to listen to what went before and then add to it. If you go around the group a few times, the stories can be hilarious. They're a lot of fun, they're easy to set up, 
And as I said, you can engineer each story situation in context so that the language and level is appropriate for the students you teach. In the children's classroom, it's very usual that children need further excuses to use English in speaking. And puppets are one way of doing this. Puppets are fun, and for children they can lead them into imaginary worlds. And what's more, the puppet can only speak English, so children need to use the language to understand and speak with the puppet. For small children, this is so natural. They make believe, and they're prepared to suspend their disbelief in order to talk to that puppet. And there are many kinds of puppets too. Puppets can catch the children's attention easily, and they create a non-threatening and warm atmosphere. They motivate students to speak English, obviously, and they allow for more interaction. They can provide more exposure, and possibly other accents as well, if you can do that. They integrate all language skills and create opportunities for multi-sensory input. If the characters are cute, children like to interact with them even more. There are many types of activities that you can use puppets for. You can use it as a language assistant to give instructions. You can use it to introduce the next activity or use it as a partner or a model to start an activity. You can play games with the puppet. You can read or tell a story with the puppet and you can do short dialogues, exercises or even vocabulary or pronunciation drills with it. The possibilities are virtually endless and they're a tried and tested and well-loved component of many young learners' classrooms. Why not give it a go if you don't have one already? In this input, we introduce some of the key concerns that relate to teaching speaking. Speaking effectively in English is one of the main things that parents want for their children, and it's often the thing that gets the least amount of attention in tra a traditional classroom. Therefore, we need to make sure we provide the conditions, support and opportunities for maximising children's spoken English. And we also can give parents suggestions for how they can help their child speak more out of class. In this input, we touched on the following areas. Creating a positive environment where learners are happy to speak and they're comfortable. Listening carefully to what they say, not only the language that they use to say it. Teachers can rephrase and extend what students say. The important thing is that you plan your roles during speaking tasks in advance so you know how you can best help them. You should accept, respect and encourage learners' efforts to communicate meaning, even if it's not perfect. Don't get too heavy-handed with the correction. Let them speak. And you can always have time to gather up common errors and deal with those after the speaking task is over. You can have learners practice language in interactive activities, pairs and groups. We looked at some of the different interaction patterns that you could use and there are many ways. We said that variety is the key here to keep it fresh, motivating and fun. Use a range of natural situations and topics to support authentic language use. Keep those display questions to a minimum and instead try to speak as naturally and authentically as you can, as if you were talking to somebody who fully understands you. Don't interrupt to correct small errors. Speaking is really about the successful communication of a message. Keep the focus on speaking, not on practice of grammar and vocabulary. You need to be clear on those aims, otherwise students won't have the opportunities they need to develop fluency, accuracy and automaticity in their spoken English. How do your course materials deal with speaking? What range of activities are there? What can you use directly? And what do you think you should adapt, replace or supplement to ensure that your classroom offers the best chances for learners to develop their speaking skills? But as with many language skills, speaking in class isn't enough to produce a fluent speaker. Children need to use English in as many contexts as possible. Think about what advice you can give to parents and children on ways that they can practice speaking out of class. We've come to the end, 
So take some time now to review your notes and write down any questions you have to prepare for your group discussion. You've done several tasks in this input that you would like to discuss later, so you can refer to those as well. And make the most of your online tutorial to check anything in this input that was confusing or new or you wanted to learn more about. As always, if you have the chance to try out the techniques and activities we've suggested, then note down any points you'd like to share or further discuss with your group based on what you found. Teaching speaking is a main goal, so next time you're planning a lesson, consider about how you can maximise the amount of opportunities for students to use English in speaking. Thanks for listening and watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.